Good morning everybody and welcome to Juma Game Reserve and a beautiful little furry creature of the night. It is one of our moth species that has decided to hitch a ride this morning and join us on a game drive as I hope all of you will be doing too. My name is Tristan, on camera today I've got a Fergus, there we go, Fergus, a little two finger salute, which is not the, right, not the type of two finger salute that we sometimes refer to, but that isn't, that isn't okay, Fergus. Anyway, we're going to be out and about for the next three hours and we're going to take you on a wonderful journey through the African bush, hopefully. Now, remember this is live, it is interactive, which means hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or YouTube chat. I know some of you have already given us a wish list for the morning, so Michael, we shall certainly try and find all of those leopards that you listed, as well as hyenas and the Nkuma pride, but we will see what else there is. Maybe some of you also can participate and start a kick off our morning with what you want to see first up this morning between Scott and myself. We'll try and see what we can find, and hopefully we'll find something very interesting for all of you, as we have over the last few days, I suppose. Well, I hope that it's been interesting. Anyway... Our little moth is going to sit there. We're going to leave it exactly where it is. It's a pity it's sitting the way it is at the moment because it actually has the most beautiful marking on its wing, which I can't really show you. I'm, I thought I might be able to get it, but it's got this little kind of gold patch. I don't know if you can see it. Just at the back there, there's a spot on it, which should maybe help somebody idea it if somebody does know. And it's a sort of goldish color on that back area, which is very, very cool. So what we'll hopefully do is is try an idea for you at some stage. I have seen them before and I remember I found some sort of name for them but I'm going to try and see if I can pick up exactly what the name is. But there you go, you can get a sort of relative size. It's a small little fella and you can see why it's a moth. If you look on these front sort of antenna, they're very feathery. If it was a butterfly, they would be more club-like. So a straight structure with a little end to it. Also, these guys like to lie with their wings flattened against their body, whereas butterflies tend to hold their wings up flattened against the wings itself. And then also just the general demeanor of this little animal is very, very furry. Most of the butterflies don't have the same kind of fur action. And also they are nocturnal. So this would have been out and about last night and landed on the car because the light was left on naughty us and they a whole bunch of moths really were all around the place so this is just one that's hitched a ride and is going to have an entertaining morning i hope and hopefully it will see lots of cool things and live a life of an extreme moth Becky, will you want to see some male lions and hopefully they will roar for for all of us? Well, I, I would really hope that that is the case because it is something absolutely phenomenal when the lions roar. Last night we, we did a little Christmas crew sleigh run where we went for a little drive after dinner just to go and see the two Birmingham boys that were around last night and they did put on a serious show for us and they seriously roared their lungs out twice and then we decided that we had really gotten what we go well, more than what we could have asked for and so we started then coming home interestingly enough though Tinio was already starting to move south he wasn't far from the southern boundary when we left he was about I'd say 20 meters north of that but in Suku is carrying a nice little paw injury so he's looking a bit like Tingana did last week where he's hobbling around all over the place and looks really uncomfortable so the chances of him being around is probably quite good maybe he he's just decided to sleep and, and try and kind of sleep off that injury a little bit much like what Tingana Ghana did for those few days so we'll just have to see hopefully we'll get lucky and he's still around but you never know maybe Tinio dragged him a little bit and he ended up having to go a little further afield right just cruising slowly along just cruising slowly along um, Ingwe Ali at the moment, just checking some of these mud wallows, seeing if there may be any sign of either Shadow or Tandy. The sisters have both been seen in this area recently, and I think it was Chris or Trista. Trista? I didn't hear very nicely. Sorry, Nikki. But you're wondering what's first on my list. Of Chris, ah, there we go. First on my list this morning, probably Tandy's den, I think. We're going to maybe just poke our noses in there, see what happens, see if we can get some sort of luck and see whether or not the little cub, who seems to be an absolute adventurer because it's all over the place and running around like a little hooligan, is maybe back at the den safely with mom there. So that's maybe where we're first going to head to, just waiting for it to get a little lighter because it's going to be very difficult for the camera to make anything out and we can't put lights on that little cub. So just waiting for a little bit more lights before I head in that direction. But while we kind of meander our way along, let's go back across to well, not back across, let's go to Scotty for the first time so he can say good morning and tell you what his plans are for the remainder of the day. 
Good morning and welcome on board. My name is Scott. I'm teamed up with Senzo on camera and we are following some tracks of a female leopard. I'm not sure which female leopard it is. It could be either Shadow or Tundi, judging by the area that we found these tracks in. They were just behind us, the last tracks we had, heading towards the treehouse waterhole. And tracking from a vehicle requires you to kind of be a little bit, you know, act a little bit differently to tracking on foot because you can't move as slowly and precisely but what I'm doing is kind of just looping ahead in the general direction that she was going in the hope that she will continue down this major pathway which is a road for us but also a pathway for the animals now I really do hope that Tristan does get lucky at Tundi's den site once it has lightened up a little bit more because it's just the most incredible incredible scene down there if and when that cub does poke its head out Tristan and I were having happy visions. We were trying to envision what we would like to happen and what we decided as first prize would be a lunar moth, which is an incredibly beautiful green moth, to land on the nose of the cub and then Tristan can use his very fancy camera skills within which to get a portrait picture of a tiny leopard cub with a beautiful green moth on its nose. So, hopefully our visions come true. It appears like my plan to loop ahead of this female leopard has not worked out as I wanted because I don't see any tracks coming further down this road but what I'll do is I'll do a big loop back around another road towards the waterhole and see if we don't get lucky. Morning Matthew, you are wondering about possibly using infrared lights to view the cub and sorry Aegis not Matthew um, and I guess yes that would be an option um, it certainly would but I'm actually not sure how the infrared rigs work here and because we've hardly been spending any time out after dark I don't think we kind of geared up for using them at the moment so it usually means putting on a big infrared light somewhere mounting it on top of the camera um, but I haven't used these uh, vehicles and or rigs for any after dark filming just yet so I think Tristan may be a better person to ask about that and to be honest I mean it's just a short few minutes that we'll have to wait for it to lighten up the fact that it is overcast today also makes it a little bit darker than normal very good well I was really hoping we we're gonna find some more of her tracks coming down here but no joy maybe she's changed direction after she had a drink of water Ooh. Uh oh now I've just got a report that Tristan's getting some rain he's further to the east of us and now that I look south I can see a wall of kind of misty drizzle approaching us so we'll let him get his rain covers on quickly and then we'll have to probably put ours on a little bit after that sorry I'm not uh, looking at you guys too much but I am trying desperately to find tracks of this leopard hence me hanging out the side of the car looking down ah oh, guide monkey you've made a wonderful request but it's going to be a difficult one to fulfill you are hoping that we could try and find some baboons a troop of baboons to spend some time with because that would be fun and it certainly would however there simply are not many baboons that hang around Juma although there's kind of some baboon ninjas that are causing trouble raiding the lodge and our kitchens they've managed to work out how to open a sliding glass door which is a bit of a problem um, but we don't ever see them hence ninja baboon um, well I haven't seen them I guess the somebody must have seen them at some point stay away drizzle seems like it's beginning to get a little bit thicker this is going to be a bit frustrating because it's like it's not even rain but we've got some very important equipment on these vehicles that don't really enjoy swimming so it'll be bearable for now we might have to wipe the screen of the camera from time to time no bad weather 
you can probably notice the dashboard is probably going to change in colour slowly. There's a few little droplets of water falling down onto it. Oh, this isn't good. Okay, well, we're probably going to have to stop here and get ready to cover up so as to not take any chances because if we fried some equipment we're not going to be very popular with our tech wizards so let me stop here no further sign of this female leopard that probably came down to the treehouse waterhole and have a drink but hopefully while we stopped here for a few moments we might be able to hear some audio some telltale alarm calls or something like that which will give us a better idea of where exactly she's gone So, I think Tristan's still getting his rain covers on, so you'll have to witness how this all happens. And Tristan is now ready, so you're not going to have to go through this process with us. And we will see you a little bit later. Please cross your fingers for this misty, drizzly rain to disappear. Well, ready is a relative term. I, I feel like we are not quite ready. We are, are slowly on our way back to get a roof because we've been caught short by this misty, rainy weather that is blowing in from the east and it's just getting worse and worse. The visibility is becoming almost non-existent and so we're kind of trying to head our way home without getting everything too wet. But you can see, if you look to our left-hand side, how everything is just starting to close in. I know the lens has got a bit of water on. I do apologize about it. It's just trying to get back quickly to get our roof on so that we don't get everything too wet is why it's like that so I do apologize and we will kind of clean it all up just now but you can see that kind of rainy misty weather that's blown in. and it's come out of nowhere when we left camp it was fairly clear and the clouds were actually quite high and all of a sudden it's just dropped and just come straight in from the east and it looks really quite dense and thick and I can't even from here normally I can see all the way to sort of cheetah cut line side but I can't see anything at the moment you can't see anything to the west or the east and so we're probably going to get fairly damp this morning which is not ideal I was hoping that it would be a nice dry start to the day and hence why we went without our roofs we were a little like I say a little naughty and that we thought maybe we'd get away with it but as you can see we haven't really right well let's carry on our impalas are slowly migrating across quarantine clearings and going from one side to the other I would imagine that they're going to spend quite a bit of time here this morning there's no reason for them to move too much given that there is no sun that is pushing them off the open area. Now, Sharma, are you wanting to see Ellie's leopards and lion cubs? Ooh, lion cubs would be nice. I think Kahuma Pride and Six Pride both have cubs, so it would be nice if they just started to come back into our area. Oh, thank you, Fergus. There we go. Thank you. Excellent. So, Fergus is a surprise with an umbrella. There we go. But I feel like it will be better served over the camera, Fergus. We're all about making plans in this vehicle. Fergus and... Uh, am I the most important? Keep the talent dry. I feel like I feel like your camera is the most important process in this whole thing. I feel like if, as we've noticed, that if I get ejected from the vehicle, the show still goes on, and we can still watch what's being filmed. So keep the camera dry, and that'll be good. Now you can see we've got a few different species of animals. We've got some zebras. That looks like the McCurdy Herdy has made a return back to quarantine. There's a few members of them kind of drifting off into the misty, rainy weather and just trying to sort of stay safe. I would imagine most of these animals are probably fairly nervous of going anywhere near a thicket right now because it was perfect hunting weather for the cats so if any of the cats are out and about hunting this is going to be the best weather for them they'll be able to kind of come out and hunt them and that's why they are in this open section oh bless you this little impala Pensive, you say you can we check the hyena den early and then a cute baby leopard and that would be an amazing morning. Well, I suppose we can do that. I know that one of the Juma stations is on the way to the hyena den as we speak. So I'll just wait for an update from them. I'm not going to kind of chase them out of that sighting so long. So I'll wait for their updates and then we'll, if it's active, well, we certainly will try and head in that direction and see what we can find as well. So that's the kind of plan. But And then from there, we'll try and meander our way towards Tandy's den. But we are going to have to put on a roof at some point as well. 
Actually wondering if the rain will affect seeing Tandy's cub. It could do. Um, you might find a situation where Tandy will be curled up inside that little cave where she disappears with the little one and not really too keen to come out into the rain. That could very well be possible. So we're just going to have to see. Hopefully what happens is, is that the rain stops and then with all the freshness of the grass being wet and, and those kind of things, often Tandy will come out and hopefully the little one is curious about all the rain that's fallen and water on the grass and all those kind of things and will come bounding out and seeing what's going on. So that's what I'm hoping. I, I mean, it's going to be touch and go as to whether we can get there. Right. I'm going to head off to get my roof. While we do that, I believe Scott has battened down the hatches on his side. He's got his covers on. Let's jump across to him. Welcome back everyone. Yes, we've got our kind of rain cover set up on. It's uh, a makeshift kind of a, a setup that isn't completely watertight. So that's why Tristan is going to head back and put a more elaborate cover on. Hello Octo Gurley, you'd like to know how much has Juma changed since I was last year about a year and a half ago? And there's two new roads basically that have been uh, built, one off Mumba Road and one off Balanites Road. So that's quite uh, useful um, for us, a few extra roads to explore and they take uh, us through areas that we're quite big blocks, so it's very useful. Um, other than that, no major changes. The one big thing that I have noticed though is a complete lack of buffalo. I have not seen one buffalo since I've been here and that is very, very surprising because before we would always see buffalo. Usually not necessarily big herds, but at least um, the, the kind of smaller bachelor herds of the big old males. There used to be quite a few dugger boys lurking around, uh, in and around a lot of the water holes. So we'd always have a few to see, but they are no longer around, I'm sure. Buffalo will slowly filter back into this area now that the vegetation is recovering from the drought period. Um, what else has changed? I mean, our FC is in a new spot. There's been quite a few uh, improvements done to our camp. So, a few small kind of behind the scenes things, but in terms of stuff that you guys will well, that'll affect the safari. Not a huge, huge deal. We used to be able to traverse Arethusa when I was here, whereas that's no longer the case. And then for a short period, we also used to traverse a property called Cheetah Plains, but that's also subsequently changed since I was gone. Oh, you wouldn't believe it, but we found the female leopard tracks that I'm almost certain have come all the way from Trios Waterhole to here. They're just on our right. There's one over there. Should be able to get to. Send. Exactly, buddy, where I'm doing that circular motion with my finger, that is where you should zoom the camera. There we go. So. Oh, sorry. Um, so those are the female leopard tracks. Um, we're not going to talk too much about them and we're going to carry on because there's a strong likelihood that she has crossed over our southern boundary and she's but it's probably shadow judging by where she's crossing over here and she tends to be spending a lot of time uh, kind of half her time on our property and half her time south of us um, where we cannot go on the other side of this road. I just want to make sure that we don't find any of her tracks actually coming back because had she have been successful in making a kill behind us somewhere on our property she may have stashed it somewhere and then headed off to go and collect her cub and then come back. So here's her tracks still going here. I am guess she's going to cross straight over onto this prominent pathway. The reason why we make that little scrape in the sand as we go is so that if we do lose kind of track of where she was, it's easy to find the last track. And then you can kind of try and re-piece together the puzzle. It's very difficult tracking in this flat light. I will tell you that much for free. If it was sunny now, 
It would be much easier to see where she has gone. But I'm feeling just about blind here. I just want to make 100% sure she did cross here. Where on earth have those tracks gone? Uh, here we go. Back on track. Uh, here we go. Another one. Another one. It's interesting how much the angle helps you when tracking, even when the light is flat, if you kind of swivel around and chop and change, you will notice that there are different ways to go about seeing them. So what I'm going to do is I'm also just going to break a little branch here to help alert any guides who are coming through this area that there are some tracks. They'll also see the scuff marks of my feet which indicate that something happened there, so it will just help the trackers see what's going on. Huh. Well, I wonder if we're going to have to go and put our proper rain covers on. We probably are. Tristan is still doing that. <laughs> Emma, you are surprised that I can tell that there are female leopard tracks. Um, they, it's really actually not that difficult to be totally honest. Um, the male's tracks are a lot bigger. The only time that it can be tricky is of course if it's a young male. A young male with small feet could kind of confuse you for a female. But the female's feet have also tend to have a bit, bit more of an angular back pad, whereas the male's pads are a bit more rounded. I mean, it's really tricky to see that, but there is a, a theory that suggests that. So, it's yeah, it's really not too tricky. And Angela, another thing that really does help us is because we know this area very well, even though I've only been back a few weeks, I've already kind of worked out where leopards are moving, so that's why I can al almost hazard a, a guess that it is in fact shadow. There's a strong chance that it, it isn't, and a good example of why we shouldn't assume things is the very, uh, a few days ago basically, we arrived uh, very close to Tandy's den in the hope that we were going to find her then we saw a female leopard walking out about a hundred meters away from the den so you would automatically assume that has to be Tundi but it wasn't it was Shadow and had we have not actually seen Shadow there if I'd have gone and just found tracks they would have assumed oh well Tundi's just left the den site but it wasn't her so it's a very good reminder how we must we can guess but we must never be certain or, or assume certainty of tracks being of a certain individual because like I just said, you can sometimes get it wrong because Mother Nature often surprises us. Oh, this weather is not ideal. Hmm. It is going to slow us down. Octo Gurley, you interested to know how we well, you know, if there are any other tricks the, that we use to communicate with guides or leave signs for guides of possible signs or tracks other than dropping a branch on the road. Um, and no, there's nothing that I really um, know of that guides do. But look, there might be in some areas, but it's mainly dropping a branch and then communicating on the radio. And I must communicate on the radio right now just to let everyone know that those female leopard tracks cross south. Stations, uh, the Cornsor cross south on. Apologies, uh, Weavers near Skari, Maine. Didn't give the best update there. But people should have been able to assume that it was south out of our southern boundary. Oh, I can hear some elephants yodeling up ahead of us. I've just seen a few more scuff marks in the ground. Let's go and see what's exciting these Ellies quickly. While we race ahead and do that, we will be sending you back to Tristan, who I think has got his rain cover all on and set up and ready for action. 
We do indeed. Look at us. We're all spiffy now. We've got rain covers. We've got a roof. I've got my little rain suit on. So we're all looking quite fine now and hopefully going to be somewhat waterproof. Although it's this tough kind of weather where it's, it's misty rain. So no matter how much protection we've got, the water seems to just sort of seep in everywhere and go into a situation where it kind of just gets into all the places where it shouldn't. So we're trying to just drive slowly, make sure that we're not drawing too much water into our area. Sky Doggy, you want to know how long it takes for us to put on full rain covers? Well, the time that you, from the time that you saw us going to Scott to the time that you've seen us now, is that is our full rain covers on, roof on, camera protected, and that's as quick as it is. So, I mean, we also still had to drive to camp, so it was a fairly military style operation this morning. We had Conrad out waiting, felt like I was like in Formula One pit lane, so I just drove in and there was people there, and we grabbed the roof and then I just put it on and it was like those guys with the little wrenches for the tires and then off we went so it was all very well scripted and well done so good job Conrad good job Fergus and we've certainly proved that we can do it quite fast Snazzy vets, no, they most certainly do not feel safer from the predators. The predators will hunt in this because it is the perfect kind of weather. There is dark, dingy conditions when they normally wouldn't be. There is also a situation where you've got rain that's falling, which makes noise, so that deadens the sound of these predators approaching. And then you also have a situation where the scent is, is sort of washed away and, and it's not carried on the wind as effectively as it would be in dry conditions. So it's much easier for predators to be hunting in this and they will hunt in this. They're going to hunt a lot in this kind of weather. They're going to try and see if they can kind of move around and and try and find as many of these little impala lambs and baby wildebeest and those kind of things as they can. The other thing is also this weather tends to... to kind of hamper the movements of tiny little babies they get cold and some of them can even die of exposure a little bit even though it's not an extreme temperature for us it's just that sudden change from hot weather to cold weather when you're a tiny little you know 15 kilogram or 10 kilogram impala lamb it's it's a lot for that little system to take on and they end up then getting you know quite weak from it and so a predator can take advantage of that so they will not be feeling safe in this like they'll be a lot more jumpy and they'll be spending a lot more time in the open areas than they would if it was a bright sunny morning that's for sure okay well let's go towards Tundi's den we're going to try and see what's happening there I, I suspect that she's going to be either away or curled up tight inside that den and the visual will be very difficult but you never know let's go and be patient and sit and try and see if something does pop out it might be quite cute if we get a little soggy cub bouncing around in the grass Lexi, you're wondering how old the leopard cub is. So the leopard cub is now approaching about seven to eight weeks old. It's, I think about eight weeks is probably about right now if I think about all the weeks that we've been. So it's getting there. It's, it's much older than what it used to, well, well, of course it's older than it used to be. We all are, yes, Fergus. Um, but it is, it's far more developed than it was, you know, a few weeks ago. And that's why the den is now open is because, as you saw yesterday, that little one can run around all over the place. It's already starting to try and climb and so it can be started to view now and it's important to get to view these little ones early because once they start to kind of develop past three months and you haven't spent much time with them it's really a struggle to try and get them used to vehicles and to try and get them to kind of work out that vehicles are not something to be afraid of and something that they should be kind of or, you know, scared and, and, want, and run away from, so or be aggressive with. So it's important to start when they're around this age, eight week old, and just try and get them nice and relaxed. This little one seems as though it's completely unperturbed by cars. It didn't, as, from what I saw yesterday on Scott's footage, it seemed as though she just kind of ran around or he ran around and didn't really care too much for what Scotty was up to. So that's really cool to see, and it's often like that when you've just got the one because they 
are so kind of in their own world and doing their own thing and so sort of playful and got lots of energy that they actually don't really worry too much about sort of anything else they just try and go and have fun as much as possible oh look at this this is very cool there's a spider here with a kill that's just come down off the roof so I don't know if you're gonna be able to get it Fergal. I'll try and use my finger to show you there it goes you can see it so you see it's caught something it looks like a flying oh no sorry Ferg. I think it's sorry and I know the <laughs> The autofocus system makes it very difficult for Fergus to be able to do it. But Ferg, let me try and put my finger there so that you can focus on that. That might help you a little bit. There we go. So that's going to hopefully hold the focus. But there is the little dangling insect that has been all wrapped up. And you can see how it's been spun together. It looks like a type of wasp even that it's got it's difficult to see because of the way it's all been wrapped up but it does look a bit wasp like or maybe mm, that's very cool to see but you can see the wing structure you can see the silk and the dangling silk hanging down the spider itself seems to be oh it's going upwards it's going to the roof it's being sucked upwards and i think the spider is on top there controlling that silk and pulling it up closer towards the roof again but how cool is that sometimes amazing things can just happen out of nowhere so that's where the edge of the roof is sorry ferg i know it's a tough one that i'm giving you but off it goes and the little spider has taken it up and into its jaws very cool though not always about the big things sometimes witnessing a little spider dropping down with some food from above your head is also quite entertaining Tony, generally spiders don't actively hunt, they generally trap, so they build their web and, and they construct this little net trap effectively, and so as something like a wasp or a fly or a grasshopper, whatever it may be, jumps or flies and it gets then stuck in the, in the web, and then you'll find that that spider will come in and inject its venom and wrap it up very quickly. So I think what's happened there is just the disturbance of us kind of moving around as that little spider has just checked, hang on, what's going on here, maybe I need to eject, maybe I need to get out of this situation with my prey item, otherwise I'm going to lose it with all the bumping around. And once it's realized that it's actually safer up there, not down here where there's a whole bunch of movement, it's gone back again into the folds of the roof to go and stash its prey and feed off it. So... And I think that's more the case, like I say, more a trap than, than a sort of stalk. Although some spines do that as well. Right, Tandy, are you going to grace us with your presence today? Let's see, we're going to just go up the bank here. There we go. Slow and steady wins the race, as they say. Come on, Tandy, be at home today. We've We've been so patient. I feel like... Maybe we, we deserve a win at some point. I just don't want the little cub to be running around and for us to get between her and the cub. That's all I don't want. So I'm hoping that because of the weather conditions, the little one is inside and having a good little nap. And the, well, there's some Franklins running around. I don't think that's going to be a sign of her being here. But let's try. It'll be extreme Franklin if they are there and she's been lying there with a the little cub because <laughs> that could be maybe what she even was eating yesterday. I know Scotty said she had something to eat, so maybe a little Franklin, unsuspecting scrub hair. I've seen quite a few different animals here over the last little bit. Now, what we're going to do is we're just going to park. Can you see her? Ah, there she is. She is there. So we're just going to park like this, front on, and we're going to stay nice and quiet. This is so exciting. So she is there. She's lying just in that long grass. I don't see any sign of the cub just yet, but I'm sure the cub might come out. So there you can see the top of her ears just looking at us. Good morning, girl. How are you? So she is there, which is fantastic news. Now, I'm interested to see how she reacts to the roof and how she kind of takes it in with this kind of bigger object than what we've got. We've parked quite far away and we're up the bank and she is going to look at us and she is going to probably every now and then let a little snarl out because, well, she is that way when she's around the cub. But let's just see. If we just sit nice and still, maybe she'll relax.
Proud Cat Mamba, you're asking when will Tundi's cubs start traversing around her? Well, normally around sort of 12 weeks, so three months, is when we start to see them first coming towards um, prey or f food items, and so that's normally when it starts to traverse around with her. Outside of that, you're going to find that it'll probably be only about, I would say, six months to eight months where it's actually walking around constantly and is no longer really in a den situation but at three months it will be starting to be taken towards food and to be to basically be introduced to meat and to start feeding on meat okay girl it's okay now you can see she's a little grumpy every now and then and she will growl and maybe it's because the little cub is moving around just to the right there so she you will sometimes hiss and growl. Sometimes it's even aimed at the cub itself. So I don't know if it's maybe there or maybe just a little bit to the right, Ferg. Uh, there it is. There it is. Look at that. There it is. How cute is that little one? Look, it's all soggy and it's busy moving around. How cute. So that's why she was a little growly is because the little one wasn't far away. Okay, go. So she does get like that a little bit when it's her little cub. So what I might do is I might just move a little bit and just give her a chance. Okay, girl. So you can see she's not exactly that comfortable with where we are. So we're just going to move back a little bit further and give her a bit more space that she feels a lot more comfortable. You can see now that I'm moving back, she's okay again. So I don't know what it is about the Ellie's and Tundi now at the moment. It's Like I said, the roof might also be a part of it. The roof is not the most ideal structure to be in at the den. It's got a little bit more kind of height to it and I suppose it's a bit more imposing. But if we just stop back here, hopefully she'll be okay. She's still creeping around inside there and at least we've moved away a little bit and that will make her feel a bit more confident about what's going on. But the little cub is not perturbed at all. You can see it's just bouncing around all over the place and in and out of little thickets and that's also why she probably gets a little upset is that the cub is around and it is moving and so she's just aware of that and is a little bit kind of unsure of her cub going too close to where we are so when the cub ventures closer towards us that's often when she gets a little bit more upset but she vis very visibly is kind of protecting that cub so it's not really that she's upset with the vehicles because we know we've followed Tundi a lot and it's more that the cub is moving around and she's unsure of where it's going to go and she's just making a very clear point to us that that is her cub and she needs to keep it nice and safe. Now it's interesting because Nikki's telling me that I'm parked in exactly the same place as where Scott was yesterday and she didn't growl at him. So maybe the roof is it, maybe it's the fact that it's a bit cold and wet this morning, she's a little bit cranky. But let's see how we go. I mean she's turned her back to us now which, which is good. If she was really upset with us you would find she wouldn't have turned her back like that. She would have gone and, and sort of come forward and kept sort of challenging us so it's, it's exactly the same thing as the Ellie's yesterday it's just about kind of finding a, a balance where both she's comfortable and us and that's how we go and we don't want to negatively impact her so it's better to just increase the space I mean at the end of the day look at that we can still see the little one in amongst the thickets and so there's no reason for us to worry too much about getting any closer where we are now seems to be fine although i think she's taking that little one back into the little cave now probably to go and sleep inside there joshua you're wondering if it's better to have one cub look at this little thing is this thing not the sweetest it's so busy as well it's all over the place so joshua i mean it's there's no better thing one or two doesn't really matter i mean obviously one is less work than having two or three three and two you know, there's a lot more food that you've got to find it's, it's a lot more work to protect them um so you know i mean it's i suppose it's not better for a leopard to have one or two the leopard wants to have as many as it can and so you know if it can have more than two. Oh, look at that little face. Isn't that the sweetest thing? How cute is that? So we, it's a nice spot where we're in now because Tundi is just to the right. So, you know, if we keep our voices down and, and just sit where we are, we're not making direct eye contact with her, which is what leopards don't really like. They don't like to have direct eye contact made with them. So if we just sit here, it's perfect. And the little cub is bouncing around all over the place. So we will get views of it. And it's important that we just, you know, try and respect the space as much as possible.
So cute though, that is the cutest little thing, particularly when it pokes its head up over the grass, it is amazing. <laughs> Very cool. I wonder if it's maybe been called back by mom and has been told, in you go, this is not acceptable that you are bouncing around all over the place. Very cool though. Super cute. So, catch the name if you can just repeat it. AD, that's right. So, um, you got my audio. Hmm? So, it is a problem. Do you want to know how many little ones has Tandy had? had two cubs in the first litter, which was Wabiyiza and a young one that unfortunately died. Then she had Bahuti and another cub, also that one unfortunately got killed. Then she had um, Kuchava and also a litter mate which was killed, and then Tamba and a litter mate. So you can see that she keeps having two and only raising She's just got the one, so it's five cubs that she's, or four cubs she's raised. This is the fifth one, but in total, she's had nine cubs in her lifetime. So she's got a sort of just over 50% or well, 50% success rate at this, if that's this sort of period before this one. We can't really call this one a success just yet, just because it hasn't quite gotten out of those really sort of dangerous times. Only once it reaches a year can we call it a successful kind of raising but it went bounding off in that direction how far i'm not quite sure but it's definitely moving around all over the place which surprises me As scott said to me yesterday that this little thing was running around everywhere so it's pretty incredible how it's a little adventure and seems to be loving this little den that it can bounce around in go and sort of fluff about and check in the grass go up and down the trees and i was saying in times before when we've come to this den that it is just the most in incredible little cub to grow up. There's fallen over trees, there's little stumps, there's, you know, there's, there's little gullies, and so lots of playground material for it to bounce around all over the place. The good news is that was when we were sitting here, and, and when Tandy got up and kind of came towards us, then we reversed back slightly, and she was absolutely fine with that. So, well, the little cub was. So that's good news. It means that she's not scared of the car. And so we will continue to get really good views of her. Now, while we sit here, because of the fact that we're having a bit of a breakup in our audio and our picture, we're going to try and just reposition slightly. And while we do that, let's go back across to Ralph in the Masai Mara so he can say good morning. fantastic scene here out in the Maasai Mara. We're in Kenya and uh, my name is Rolf Kirsten and we've got Archie on the camera there. That's it. Thank you Archie. Um, what a fantastic morning. It is nice and fresh. There's a little breeze coming through. Now folks, thanks for joining us on this, uh, this morning game drive with Safari Live. Please join us on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on your YouTube live channel please send your questions and your comments uh, as we go through the the morning newspaper and try and find out what has been going on overnight we did as we were coming down from the escarpment hear some lions roaring so that's the direction that I've started to head in um, like we did yesterday afternoon we'll always find things in between but uh, nice to have a sort of direction or a goal to start with and and then we'll see everything else that happens along the way. Now I believe that it's quite soggy and wet over in Juma. Well, we've got a lovely clear sky here up 1,600 miles to the north in Kenya and a lovely morning for it and I think I've, I've got a good feeling that it's going to be a, a great morning's drive. So um, let's start up here, let's head down the road and let's go in the direction that we heard these lions roaring. Yesterday afternoon we did have 
Uh, it seemed to be maybe the Angama pride, but from quite a distance. And it seemed like they might have had a kill with him because there was a couple of vultures around. And uh, that was the reason we actually found them, was because they were up in the trees. And uh, so we had a look, and then that's when we saw the lions. Derm, you're making the comment that that is the most beautiful landscape ever. Well, I can tell you what, Patchy Derm, welcome to my office. This is uh, it's it's absolutely stunning. It's out of this world. It's um, yeah. I wish everybody could join me, but uh, in reality, you are joining me. You're on live, so I'll try my best to to give you the best game drive possible this morning and to make it as live as possible as well. So, now it's always going to be tricky for us to try and find these lions, you know. Yesterday we were up and down trying to fine comb this area, but with the grass this length, I tell you what, as soon as they lie down, they're almost invisible. And um, I'm sure that we drove past quite a few lions yesterday without being able to see them, or if they don't flick a tail or move a foot, <laughs> they, they literally are gone once they lie down in this long grass. Now Clifford, that's a very good question you're asking. How far does a lion's roar go or travel? Clifford, it all depends on the, the the sort of terrain as well as, as as well as what's going on with the weather because if it's a nice clear evening nice and calm no wind and uh, the lions roar it can go I'm pretty sure it can travel up to about 10 kilometers if not more that you'd be able to hear them um, but if it was a little bit windy a little bit breezy um, it, it wouldn't travel as far so it depends on that but it can really travel massive distances and and I think that's the whole purpose behind the way that they they, they give it to uh, their belly and the and the way that it is really coming from the the deepest parts of a lion. So um, while I continue here, and I'm going to try and see if I can follow up and see where these lions were calling from. Let's head back over to South Africa and Tristan with the with the den site. Well, I wish you good luck, Rolf, and I hope that you find them. I'm sure that you will if they're calling. Hopefully, they'll lead you right to where they are. Now, Tandy is just settled at the entrance to the den. You can see she's kind of listening about the cub. The last time we saw it was going off down the drainage line, and we have no idea where it's disappeared to. It hasn't come back to where mom is. But she's just sitting patiently, and she seems to be far more relaxed now. So she is listening, and she is looking around, but she seems to be a lot more relaxed about what's going on. It seems as though she, the times that she gets a little bit growly and a little bit upset is when the little cub comes closer towards where we are. That's when she tends to seem to get... A little bit more on the agitated side. If the cub goes the other way, then she seems to be absolutely fine about the whole thing. So, Michael, you're wondering if leopard cubs adjust to weaning better or faster than lion cubs do? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I suppose yes, actually, uh, maybe in in hind, in sort of retrospect. And um, if you see, I just want to watch where she goes. If you see. Um, you know, lion cubs, often when they're really two years old, they're still trying to suckle from a female that's, uh, that's producing milk. It's just almost like the competition in amongst them causes them to, to want to suckle more. Whereas leopard cubs, you know, once that female dries up, there's no other females around to suckle from. And so it tends to break that weaning process or much faster than it would on a lion cubs. The lions tend to get away with it a little bit longer um, than what the leopards do. So I suppose, yes, that is the case. Also, I mean, you'll find that leopard moms can get quite feisty with their cubs at times and will kind of push them off milk as quickly as possible. Whereas as lion cubs, because there's so many of them, the mom tends to kind of lactate for quite a while. I've noticed also with leopards, when they have just one litter like that, or one in their litter, that little one starts to go on to, to solid food very quickly and very seldom actually has anything sort of to do with milk by the time they reach seven months they're already well weaned by that so it's interesting I remember Tiani she was not suckling six 
months and she's not playing. So she making her first kill at four months. So it was an interesting thing as she just got enough meat that she didn't need to suckle very much at all. Now I'm just trying to watch what Tandy's doing. She seems to be kind of... I don't know what she's busy with. She's tail is kind of bobbing around a little bit, but like I said, I just don't want her to be getting upset with us and I can't see what she's doing. So you can also see why we struggle to see her. It's it's really a perfect den site. It's got a thicket. There's obviously a little cave inside there that she just disappears completely into. And if you came along here now, you would never know that there's a leopard with its little cub sitting in underneath there. And that's why tracking leopards and, and trying to find them can be such difficult work sometimes and also can be very very dangerous and you've got to be careful when you have a leopard and a cub around because where you're walking you've got to have your eyes and your wits about you because you wouldn't want to walk into Tundi in this area she's not going to be very impressed with somebody just arriving at her den and moving around so better to just keep aware and, and also to follow her from kills if the den moves rather like we did with this den site rather than actually just trying to track her on foot but that little tail there is going to be very good for us to watch because if that tail decides to start flicking and moving then we know that she's getting a little on the upset side you can just see it in the grass and it seems as though it's fairly relaxed and so i think we're okay for now which is good news Still no sign of the little cub coming back again. It seems as though it's still moving around on the other side somewhere. Proud cat mama, are you wondering if I think the cub is wandering off too far from its mother? Well, I, I suppose maybe it is a little bit, but if I remember Tiani, Tiani was a little adventurer. She also would go all over the place and away from mom, and I can remember Saleh saving her life three times in the first eight or actually 12 weeks um, from hyenas where she would drift off and hyenas would come along and she would then run in and try and chase those hyenas off before they got to the cub and the one time was so close that little cub only just made it to a rock and the mom arrived and got the hyena as it was trying to bite at the cub so you know it's it's it is sometimes a worry when they do drift off a little bit but uh, Tandy's a good mother there's no mistaking it she she's very protective of her little one and she's very observant so you can see she's always looking around always checking always watching trying just to make sure that there isn't anything that's too close that could potentially hurt the cub and, and like I say every time you see that cub coming closer to us is when Tandy's concern gets up and she comes and she tells us right you too close back off from my cub when the cub goes the other way you can see Tandy faces and watches the cub she doesn't really care too much for us and you'll know she'll be sitting there and she'll know where that cub is all the time she'll probably either be able to not only to see it but she'll maybe be able to hear where it's moving around and that will mean that she can keep it nice and safe so for now no, i don't think so i mean it's 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 got to explore it's got to play it's got to learn it's got to work out how to climb and how to to run around because soon it's going to be starting to be moved by a tandy moving it imagine that because when we've checked all these other den sites we've never found a cub track that she's been carrying these cubs or this to any of the dens that she's used and soon she's going to have to use her own four legs or its own four legs should I say I don't know if it's a girl or a boy to carry itself around and so it's worth it Hello everyone. Well, we've got our raincoat on and we're just doing some final modifications, which I will talk you through now. Um, basically, we are just going to connect this here and then up to here somewhere and that way we'll, I'll be able to drive without too much rain coming in, but I'll be able to see where we're going. And that way I keep the camera dry. I'll have a little window to see where I'm going. And it must be said that these rain covers need to be rethought their design because it's fairly archaic at the moment. So that can be a project for the new year. Because sadly everyone's closed for business at the moment, so we can't do anything now, but there certainly needs to be some renovations done to this rain cover which is exciting to fine-tune things and make them a bit more effective and user-friendly but we're okay for now at least this way now we can drive you guys don't have the best view but obviously most of the rain will come 
from the front as we drive into it. This is where the camera is going to stay dry and most of the equipment. And once we do find an animal, we can just film out both sides. Both sides are completely open for now. I don't know how my earpiece cables start climbing out from my arm here. <laughs> anyway, I'm all plugged in and ready for action. Okay, well very good everyone. We're gonna, actually not too sure where to head from here. Um, maybe continue towards where Tingana was with the kill yesterday evening, but you guys are heading all the way back up to the Mara with Ralph. Yes everybody, so we, uh, we're still looking for these lions that we heard roaring off in the distance, but we've spotted a couple of the usual suspects that you would find around lions and a kill in particular and now we're just trying to work out where these marabou stalks are looking or if there is a reason for them being here we haven't seen anything just yet but uh, they're normally quite a good indication of of where there's a kill or a carcass but there aren't any vultures around so maybe these two are just being stalks and just sitting in the tree so maybe we over optimistic maybe not we'll have to see we'll have to keep combing the area Right, and as we do that, we're going to head back off to Tristan, who eventually has now uh, dealt with the gremlins, and I think he's ready for you to have a look around the den. Well, hopefully the gremlins have left us alone. Interestingly enough, Tundi has just gotten up and she's walked out. The little cub is following her as she's walking away from us. They're going deeper into that thicket on the other side. But she did pick up a carcass of what I'm not quite sure. It looked like either a scrub hare or a vervet monkey. I couldn't quite see nicely, but there were two back legs. And she then dragged it off a little bit into the bush and then put it down at the entrance to the den. And then she's now walking up into that thicket. But the little one is bounding around after her and is moving with her as she's going but I think she's starting to leave the den now if you look for a little bit of movement you'll see the tail every now and then and the little one is in amongst that area with the tail and kind of moving around and chasing mom's tail around and bouncing around all over the place it's kind of full of beans this morning maybe the cooler weather means that it is going to be that way but you can see she's just in the back there underneath that fallen over tree Ferg do you want me to go back slightly maybe Let's try if we go back. It's not really much of a view from where we are, unfortunately, and I don't want to go too close to where she is. There we go. So, Lara Moore, you're wondering if we've got any guesses as to the gender of the cub? Unfortunately not. I, I mean, I haven't seen it for long enough to go, look, there it goes. Look at how small it is. It's so cute. Come on, that is the cutest thing in the whole world. And look how it just climbs around. Hello, little one. Are you going to follow mom? Are you going to go for a little expedition? This is so cool. There you go, there goes Tundi, a little one in tow, so you can get a nice idea of how big it is. Look, there it goes. <laughs> that is as cute as it could ever be. That is so cool. We are so spoiled that we get to see this and that we get to be a part of this process as she grows up and, or he grows up, like I say, Laura Moore, we don't know if it's a male or a female. Maybe some of you can zoom into some of these screenshots as it bounds away from us and maybe can get a little ID. There we go. It almost looks like a little female, doesn't it? It kind of looks a little bit like a female there. So whoever can get a screenshot of that particular part and blow it up, we can maybe get a six on what this little one is. So Anna Marie, it'll be about three months when Tundi's cub is old enough to go to a kill with her. Although Tundi is introducing her to meat now, at the end of the day, this meat, this little carcass that she's got, this scrub hair or monkey or whatever it is, is right at the entrance to the den. And that little one will be sniffing around and maybe chewing on it and biting on it just because it's a youthful exuberance. And so you never know, maybe that's what's going to happen and you're going to see a situation where... It's already introduced, but normally three months is when they are introduced to meat and are taken to carcasses for the first time. Tundi seems to be sort of 
writing her own rule book because it's for as scott mentioned yesterday it's also first for me to ever see a carcass at the den site itself where the little cub is kept it really is quite insane to think that she's doing that so be truthful you're wondering if other animals wouldn't smell her and the cub particularly with a carcass yes they would so it's dangerous to have a carcass near the den and that's why generally they don't do it is because that means that things like hyenas can find this area and find the den quite quickly um, who knows maybe she's now taking this cub off to a new den who knows it's difficult to say that she's gone off far from where we are i can't see her anymore the problem is is on the top side there is very dense and very thick and i don't want to go crashing around with her and and the cub kind of in tow I'll go back around to the road and see if we can get a view from the road and maybe we'll get lucky but I don't want to try and sort of chase her anywhere but she's maybe moving it somewhere else so Lynn you're wondering if we ever found out what she was eating yesterday at the den I would imagine it's the same thing I think it's a scrub here because it's just the two front legs or back legs left it's the two legs of something is left the rest of it is all gone she just picked up that so I'd imagine it's the same thing but it looked very scrub hair like to me it was quite long grayish coloration on the legs so either a vervet monkey or scrub hair right what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the road the road is actually not far at all I'd say maybe 50 meters from us is where Twin Dam's road is and so let's just go back to the road maybe we can get a view from the road itself if we see her coming back down this way well we can come back otherwise what i might do is just leave her where we, it is now we've had such a brilliant sighting of seeing that little one running around that i don't want to push our luck too much So James, you're wondering if this den site looks like a safe place from a risk of flooding. Well James, there's a lot of vegetation there which, I mean that must have grown over the last little bit. We know that this area flooded last year so, I mean no, I don't think so. In my mind no. It's obviously very possible that there, the cave goes up and it could be okay but in my mind it doesn't look like a very risk free place from a flooding point of view. The thing is, is that wild animals are very perceptive creatures and so I'm pretty sure if she will be able to sense if big rains are coming and then maybe move that cub accordingly so I'm not too worried about it just yet I think she's a clever enough mom and she's dealt with the floods of 2012 before so I think she'll be just fine now while I go up and try and get out of here without Rusty squeaking so much let's go back across to Scotty and see what his plans are now that his leopard has crossed south over the boundary well, I'm so excited, you guys, about a couple of great visuals of Tundi and her little cublet. I wonder where they are going. Interesting stuff, and I think Tristan's made a wonderful decision to not do any off-roading and try and stick to the roads and just keep looping ahead. So, great maneuver on his behalf. Always difficult to contain yourselves in situations like that when you are so excited to try and see as much as you can hello Jimmy you are wondering what would happen in the event that Tundi were to lose her cub well she'd probably kind of mourn for it for a few days depending on how it gets lost but I mean in most situations I've, I've noticed that Leopardess will keep going back into that same area calling calling hoping that the cub isn't infected even though a lot of the time they know full well that they are um, sometimes they will eat their cub if whatever animal killed it did not feed on it that's often the case with male leopards male leopards may just kill cubs that are not theirs and abandon them in the hope that they'll be able to start hooking up with the mom who is now single and Ordinarily, I mean, I've seen leopards who lose their cubs start mating within two weeks of losing a cub. Um, so as quickly as that, they can come back into season, mate again, wait three months, deliver the next litter and hope that they don't get killed as well. But Jimmy, it, it is an important that you do know that a lot of leopard cubs and lion cubs are lost. They've got a very, very high death rate or low success rates depending on which way you want to look at it um, so that cub's still got a very very long road ahead of it before it's big enough for us to start assuming it is going to make it through to adulthood now I've come back to these tracks of a female leopard that I found crossing south 
over this kind of road this morning in the very off chance that maybe she had made a kill and then she had gone to collect her young daughter and then come back with her but no sign of her coming back and ordinarily it's one of the coolest things to see is one set of leopard tracks heading in a direction and then a set of two returning on that very same path because they usually take the shortest path to collect their youngsters and then you very well know that there is a cub Hello Donna, are you interested to know how long will it take for that little cub's eyes to change color? They're kind of a beautiful bluish color at the moment. It, def it depends on individual cubs. Some cubs' eyes are not that bluish color from when they're born. They're kind of that normal browny yellow color. Um, and some cubs have been kind of as old as six, seven months, even up to a year sometimes, retaining those blue eyes. But I don't have any first-hand experiences. It's just kind of photographs that friends of mine have taken of bigger cubs with bluish colored eyes. But I'd say the oldest you would have a cub with that kind of a bluey colored eye would be a year. Maybe I'm wrong. But it's usually in, you know, the first three to six months that you'll notice those eyes changing color. So now the plan B is because there's no sign of uh, Shadow, Tundi's sister, coming back onto Juma. I think it would make sense for us to head up towards where Tingana had a kill yesterday. It's not too far ahead of us. So we'll go and check in on that scene. I'm confident that he should still be there because there were uh, remaining yesterday as far as I'm aware he had killed an adult female impala sometime I think the night before last or early yesterday morning so he'll probably finish it, finish it off by some stage this evening I told that Hosanna is sharing the kill with him I know Tristan didn't get any views of Hosanna when he was in that sighting yesterday but I'm hoping we get to see not one but two male leopards, a father and a son that's about two years old. Very unique that they are together. James Richards, I'm told you were wondering if there are any updates on Tingana. Not that I've heard on the radio, but there may well be some vehicles there. It's on a kind of uh, just outside our property actually, so we're going to be sniping some views from our boundary. <coughs> oh. Okay, we're going to pull over here because there's a guide who's racing along at high speeds. Who knows what they've, what excitement they've got lined up. <laughs> that was hilarious. Very good. You're going back up to the Mara. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Yes, it seems like all it's all happening down south in South Africa in Juma with these spotted cats. And for us up here in Kenya, we still trying to follow up on the direction where those lions were roaring but on our way in that direction we've come across a couple of old buffalo bulls and this one in front of us here he's having a little go at a bush um, he's venting his frustration with a little bit of a bush there but now he's he's slowly moving on They're very slow very lethargic they've been ruminating and resting up and now it's time for them to start getting the feeding done and uh, we've got some egyptian geese calling off in the distance usually making quite a racket and with the cacophony of frogs calling down towards the river that we're making our way towards and we're going to go over onto the other side because that has been an area where the marsh breakaway pride has been hanging in so for now we're still checking all the the, the spots that we've been seeing these these lions in and we're just trying to get some clues and see if we can follow up now those two marabou stalks that were in the tree i think they were just being marabou stalks and they weren't actually um, around because of any carcass but um, we always hope that we can find some extra clues i'm heading on over now towards the the airstrip i have taken a small little road and it's almost like it's disappeared into nothing there it is Krista, uh, 
there's a request from you asking if we can go and look uh, at baby hippos. Uh, that's a, a quite a good idea, Krista. Um, I am, however, just going to have to negotiate this little part of the road, and then we are heading in a direction where there usually are some hippos. So thanks. I'll actually use that now, and we'll go and look for some hippos, and maybe we'll find some lions in between. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Right, let me just go for low range, just to get over this big bump here. And Duke, you're also asking if I can find us some secretary birds this morning. Well, I did find some yesterday, so I, knew, I do know where they have been hanging out. But absolutely, let's try that. Let's go for baby hippos and a secretary bird. And then hopefully we'll get some lions. That would be nice, hey? So that's the lineup. That's the requests. Any other requests, please send them in. I can't take any uh, too many more. So let's look for two or three more and then... And we'll see if we can find them for you. Bit of funny noise coming from the vehicle. Bit of a squeak. I hope it's just some dust in the brakes. There's a, there's a question coming through from Kim Lifford, I think. Uh, didn't quite get the name there, but the question being, have buffalo killed lions before? And absolutely, they have. It's, um, it's always quite a, a risky business for lions to try and take on buffalo, because buffalo do fight back. They've got very big horns. They are solid muscle, and uh, lions need to be very careful when they go for buffalo because there are quite a few mortalities when lions do that and they need to work together as a team very well in order to take buffalo down successfully. So, heading out a little bit onto the other side of the airstrip because I do know a little spot where there's been some hippos hanging around. So we will go there and have a look. We might spot some secretary birds out on the plains here. We'll head down a little bit this way, past the airstrip, and we'll see if that blue-eyed hyena is still hanging around. If we get lucky, she might be there next to the airstrip. We could have another look at that. Almost vampire-like blue eye of a spotted hyena. I've never seen anything like it. If anybody was watching that morning's drive, it was absolutely amazing. You're wondering what is my favorite animal species in the Mara? Um, Ryan, that's a tough question because uh, I've, I've started to see lots of new species that I've never seen before. And let's just have a look here over onto our right, Archie. There's a couple of jackals that are just trotting through. Now, Ryan, I must say that I do really uh, appreciate the spotted hyena and I think for now, I'm going to say my choice is actually the olive baboon because that's a new species for me and plus it is quite special for here in the Masai Mara. As we look out over the plain, there's these lovely little jackals trotting along. Uh, it's quite interesting to watch the jackals as they move because they often trot like they are now. But if you look at their tracks, it can actually seem like they have a bent chassis because the back come next to the front legs so they often run almost sideways with a bent chassis it's very interesting to see that track along the, for instance along the road or, or on an airstrip well that's the scene here it's 
very quiet, very calm. Animals are moving, doing their morning business. And the jackals obviously also have been mooching around, probably following some lions or hyenas around over the night. Now, the name there is quite a long one. It's a wee Siberian uh, something, excuse me, but it was quite a long name. You're, you're asking if we can, if we can see some caracal, uh, and that would be uh, much obliged. I tell you, I would also love to see some caracal. But they are quite a secretive little cat, and almost even more difficult to see than leopards. Now, I know with Safari Live, everybody thinks uh, that it's quite easy to spot leopards. I've told this story before. I was guiding for four years before I, f I saw my first wild leopard. And it's very special in the Sabi Sands with the leopards that are habituated as they are, that um, people like Tristan and Scott can be showing you them daily. But uh, normally, leopards, when they hear vehicles when they hear people they just lie down in the grass and you go straight past them and very difficult to see and caracal um, is the same if not even more difficult so it would be an absolute brilliant morning if we could spot some caracal but um, we'll we'll try our best but I'm not making any promises but uh, any time that we see some caracal would be a very good morning for me so, as you can see up in front here, we've got the wooden sock of the airstrip and a lot of people would be able to fly in here into the Maasai Mara, but also it's generally important that wherever you have lodges and you have tourism and guests coming in, that there is a, an airstrip available for, for emergency purposes primarily, but then also enabling people to be able to get flown in. And the topi just running around, having a little bit of a, a spin, getting the energy out in the nice crisp coolness and freshness of the morning. Everybody's out on the plane having a bit of a graze, probably quite relieved to have survived the night. Now Philip, I'm not sure if it's the same Philip that was asking the question yesterday about the aloe suckling on the water buck, but Philip, you're wondering um, with all the new species that I'm getting, have I been keeping a Mara bird list? Yeah, and as, we, as I say that, we've just got some zebra that have been giving a, a nice little go at each other. The one actually fell down. But, uh, Philip, I haven't started a bird list as yet, but I can tell you that I've already got over 20 new species of birds that I haven't seen in South Africa. So, um, I'm, I'm not a big bird list keeper. I do, however, love my birding, but I'm not, I'm not a... I'm not a twitcher per se, and I don't keep lists. I prefer to um, just enjoy it. I'm not as serious as some, but I, I, I've seen a lot of new birds, and I'm really enjoying it. And uh, and I think I'm going to keep enjoying it because there are there's a lot of new birds here. They, there's a lot that are obviously in similar families. Um, but I have seen a whole bunch new and this is what I've been talking about with zebra that very often if you see a zebra without a tail it's normally because of another zebra having bitten it off and they do kick and bite and it is quite aggressive but it can be awesome to watch especially in the nice early morning with them full of energy they're going to have a nice go at each other here Our pajamaed donkeys. And they're having a full go, aren't they? A little bit of squealing going on. Maybe that was quite sore. <laughs> I'm assuming this is a couple of younger males, but it could be 
should be a female in there, I'm not sure. You see how they go down on their hocks and they try to bite each other and going around in circles. And where are the lions now? While these guys are engaged in battle, that's, that's a very good time for lions to be hunting. But um, they're out in the open plains so they can see off into the distance and there's lots of animals around here as well so I think the lions would really struggle to sneak up on anything out here and once again you can see that they almost lack that shadow stripe completely you can see a little smidgen of a stripe but that's generally the way that we would identify them now this is It's, it does seem like it's it's a little bit of a, a mix between a, a play fight and a, and, a, and a real fight. And they are trying to establish a little bit of dominance, but it, it, it's quite difficult to tell. Sometimes, you know, they can really go for it and carry on, and then they get back on their hind quarters, and they're almost punching each other and trying to bite, but then all of a sudden it can all just relax, and they start grazing next to each other. And you get all excited, and then... It's all just back to business. Let's get down to some grazing. And snorting at us in disgust, almost as if, well, what are you looking at? Well, we're looking at you, buddy, you and your mate, who were really being clowns a minute ago. <laughs> right, I think that's all going to calm down. And while it does, let's move off down the road. Yes, yes, and we've got some more zebra off in front of us here, and it's it's really lovely setting on the plains. And I'm looking forward to next week uh, because Archie and I we're going to head over the river and look for cheetah. Kathy, you're wondering why would mares act this way and not stallions? Well, mares would also be wanting to establish a little bit of dominance within the group, um, but it would generally be your stallions who would especially take it to that quite heavy level of being very serious. Now, Archie, just over on the side here, we've got a couple of hyena that, that were moving in with quite um, a lot of purpose and I don't know if the one actually had something in its jaws yes it has stopped and I'm not sure what it's doing or if it's feeding on anything I don't know if you can pick it up there it's quite far but uh, definitely something going on with those hyenas the one was chasing it and the one in the front there I think it's got its head down it's chewing on something And there are a lot of animals out on the plain and those topi sort of ran off when they saw the hyena because that topi's got a youngster there but that hyena had something in its jaws I don't know where it got it from and where it was coming from but you know the hyenas they're always up to something and if he's running with purpose you generally know that he's either after something or he's already got it now there seems to be a little bit of interest in whatever that one has. It's a shame it turned the other way and we can't see exactly what's going on but there's licking of the chops so there's something going on. It's managed to steal something or catch something from some, somewhere up in front. So maybe it is as a result of there being some lions up in front and maybe this hyena has now managed to get a little bit of scraps or steal it from the lion. Um, but we're going to try and follow up on that. I'm going to go and have a look and see where this hyena came from. But in the meantime, let's head back to Tristan, um, back in South Africa. Well, 
We've tried to find Tandy again and no luck. She seems not to have come out even though she was walking right up towards the road. We came on that side, there was a whole bunch of impalas so they would have shouted had they seen her. So I think she just lay down in that thicket and we decided, well, we've been so spoiled for the last two drives with the most amazing views of that little... Oh, there she is right here. Whoopsie. Sorry, girl. I didn't see you there. Sorry, my girl. Have you brought your cub to a new den? So she's right in front of us, which is a long way from where we were. We are a long, 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 dire long way from the den now. I'm all the way up onto Central Road, so I don't know why she's come here. I'm just going to back up a little bit further because... I didn't actually see her, to be honest with you, and she, I think, has moved her cub, to be honest. I think she's, because she's got that carcass at the other den, I think she's got a situation where she's moved it and put it in under these little pipes here, which is very out in the open. Now, let's just see if the little cub does come back into this area. She seems to be okay for now, so... I'm surprised that she's here. I really didn't think she would have gotten this far. Is the little cub there? Yes, the little cub is with her. So she's brought the cub a long way away. I think she's decided she wants to try and move it to another den. So she's brought it all the way to these pipes that are at Giraffe Dip. And she's going to put it there in the little pipes that are here. So this is an area that we're going to probably have to now zone. Well, not zone, but we're going to have to be careful of when we drive around here. Because leopards love to use pipes. I know that shadows use them, Karulas use them. They've all used them, but there's a little one. Look at it. How sweet is that? You've gone on a big walk this morning, little one. You've gone a long, long, long way from where you were, and I'm sure it's because of that carcass that was at the den. I'm sure she's gotten to the point where she doesn't want to leave this little cub where there's meat, and so she's now finding a new den. Look at it. It's so cute. It's trying to go up the bank, but it can't get up. You are a little adventurer already, and very relaxed as well, considering mom is moving around as much as she is, and this is good for us. This is good to see Tundi walking, and look at that. How cool is this? This is so cool. Don't worry, girl. I'm going to let you go and carry on. She's going back towards where the carcass is. Maybe it was just to come and see what was going on and she's decided she's not going to do it. But how cool. Look at it just trundling along. <laughs> this is so, so spectacular. Now, I'm just giving her a little bit of space, letting her walk a little bit before I reposition ourselves. And hopefully once we go towards the little bridge there... We'll be able to see her. She's coming around this side, but I, I don't really want to follow her too much. I just want a situation where we can kind of just keep tabs on her. So she's just straight through. She's in there. You can see her moving away from me with the little one at the moment. And she's going back the way she's just come. So I don't know if maybe this is just to show the little one around and take it and, and just check what else is out here. But at least she's moving this little one. And that's amazing news. How epic is that? The little one is so cute and mobile as well. You can see it's bounding along after mom. Very cool to see. And this is what we need, is we need more positive encounters like this with Tandi, where we see her, we watch her, we watch her go about her business, we let her kind of walk away from us and move kind of down into the drainage lines and we don't actually worry her too much but that was so exciting there she's going to come out right out into the open so she's moving back towards the other den so let's go back across so there she goes you see she's just on top right out in the open the little cub i don't think is able to climb just yet can you see a little bit forward okay so she's starting to come back to fetch her cub because her cub was struggling to get up the bank so there she is and there's a the little one where are you going you can't go back down so Tandy's now coming back down and saying hey you have to come with me you've got to go where I tell you to go and the little one is being a typical naughty little cub and is doing its own thing and is messing around and playing around there it goes how cool is that <laughs> you're so small still little one in amongst mom's feet as per normal <laughs> is that not the cutest thing Right, so that's the last view we're going to get of Tundi. We're going to leave her for the morning. I don't want to disturb her any more than what we have already. She looks like she's looking for a new den. And so while we kind of carry on and enjoy what amazing sighting we had, let's go back to Ralph in the Mara. 
Yes, and we've come just a little bit to down the airstrip, and uh, we've been watching these topi, and the youngsters have really been enjoying the nice, crisp morning freshness. They've been doing their morning exercises. They've been careering around, and there was even a little gazelle that got involved as well, although he was much smaller. He's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a lot more agile and, and faster than the topi, but um, and the topi weren't to be outdone. And there's one still running around there. It it's fascinating out here on the plains. We've we've got oh, numerous species of animals from topi to gazelle to giraffe. We've got elephant off in the distance. We've got zebra. We can hear African fish eagle calling. And we've just passed those hyena and Archie, I think he's just going to pan a little bit just to give you an idea that we've got all sorts and we almost could sit right here and have an entire game drive because we could chat about all sorts that's going on. And there comes a giraffe through. And the hyenas that were behind us, they are hard at work feeding on whatever that bone or head was that they they managed to scavenge from somewhere but um, yeah we're still going to head on down the road it's not as exciting as watching Tandy with her cub but I tell you what it's, it's very interesting with all these different species now Joy you're wondering uh, if there are topi nurseries, and, and probably what you mean is, is it similar to that of the waterbuck, uh, which do have the nurseries? Not quite the same. Uh, the waterbuck, they'll drop in quite big groups, whereas the topi, um, they just generally out on the plain, and they will, there will be some babies around, but the mommy's not generally very far from that. So they don't drop their, their babies in a nursery like the waterbuck do, um, but there can be topi times when they're all in an area together. So, I'm going to head down towards this elephant. We're going to see what else we can find in this particular area. But let's send you over to Scott, who's got that spotted cat up a tree. We certainly do. We don't have the best view. We're sniping a view from a kind of boundary road and you can just see Tangana's eyes peering around. He's up in a marula tree lying next to the remains of a female impala kill that he made probably the night before last and hard to say how much of the kills remaining. We don't have the best view from where we are. We're probably parked about 80 meters away and I am told from some of the guys that do have access to get closer underneath that tree that is in that Hosanna is also lurking nearby. Now Hosanna is a two-year-old young male leopard who is his son in fact and despite the fact that it is his son the fact that he is tolerating him so close to a kill is quite interesting because ordinarily male leopards will not take any kind of extra bystanders along with their kills especially not another male maybe a female would be tolerated but definitely not a male now, i'm so happy you guys have been enjoying some incredible scenes up in the mara with ralph and of course the magical moments with tristan and tundi with that little cub on the move exciting times and tristan's doing a great job trying to work out you know where to go and how how long to stay and it's always a tricky business but Tristan is very sensitive and I wouldn't think of a better person to be sharing that sighting with you and controlling that sighting and making decisions as and when they are needed to be made I think we're gonna move on from this spot though because we've been waiting here for about 20 minutes now and I just don't think it's worth our while staying any longer um, let me just stop and give you a little view of the kind of impala legs dangling from behind him there. You can see next to his tail dangling there, there's an impala leg. But hard to say how much of the impala is still draped over those branches and how much longer they will be here. I'm guessing not too much though. So hopefully they'll be up and on the move this evening. 
No sign of Hosanna down there. Apparently he is lurking around somewhere in the grass. But I don't think we will get a visual from where we are here, which is a bit of a pity. But like I said, hopefully this kill will be finished sooner rather than later. And then they will come out and possibly come back onto Juma where we can see them. Very good. Now, when that vehicle was racing past us a little bit earlier on, they shouted, Madorangala, which means male lion. But I've heard no further reports on the radio as to those lion coming across onto our property. So, ooh, hang on. You can see quite a few vehicles moving further down this cut line. So let's race down there um, and see what it is that they are possibly looking at. Maybe these lions are cl closer than we expected them to be, but according to the report I got, they were probably about two miles further down that road. Let's cruise along there and see what happens. Hello Guide Monkey, you would like to know what are the kind of rules and regulations regarding these invisible boundaries which are essentially just roads and how does it all work? Well, basically each uh, and every lodge and or outfit like us, I mean we're the only property that drives around that isn't a lodge, but each and every lodge and us have got certain properties that we can traverse. And it's a basic rental agreement um, where certain landowners allow you to pay rent to traverse X amount of land. Um, we've only got access to about one and a half thousand hectares of land in total mainly which uh, it is comprised of the Juma property and then a small extra little few hundred hectares on Chitwa and it's for very good reason that people have got a limit to how much la uh, how many vehicles they uh, lease out per per area of traverse it's like owning a block of flats there's only so many tenants that you can have in there before it becomes a nightmare and it's exactly the same here so we sadly because we've come into the fray later than all the lodges did this area has been operating commercially uh, for about 50 years now so you tend to find all of the agreements were kind of already set up between various lodges um, some lodges have got small traverse and also not very many rooms and therefore not very many vehicles so that you can have maybe four or five small lodges all sharing four or five small properties amongst one another or you get uh, some lodges which are fortunate that have got like 10,000 hectares all to themselves and then they've generally got more rooms and about 16 vehicles that's kind of like the camp where I started my career oh we're in luck there's a treat up ahead of us so stick around just need to go through this dip and pop up the other side and then uh, and we'll have a little treat for you so I think that should be able to help you guide monkey um, we sadly like I say are trying our best to get more traverse um, but we are battling to do so um, which may mean we may end up actually leaving this area and going somewhere where we do get more land that is a reality if we can't snaffle any more deals now there are three vehicles in the sighting here so I'm just gonna park off at a distance here and give you a quick view of this male line there you can see it in the corner a car, yeah but I mean <laughs> okay well we're gonna send you away while we get into position here and we'll see you a bit later It's still it's so fascinating when you can when you can literally move within a hundred meters and you've got sightings like this. Now this elephant was grazing a little bit closer to us. He has now shown us his bottom very rudely, but hopefully he's going to turn around a little bit and give us a, a bit of a side view because he's got a lovely set of tusks on him. A nice calm lone bull just moving through the plains here 
and I have heard some hippos down in the river so I think we're going to be able to tick off that first request in a little while with a young hippo and uh, after that hopefully we'll be able to see some secretary birds as well. Uh, I know that it's not amazing action that's been happening um, but we've had these dopey running around with all their energy, we've had this elephant nearby, we've had the high Hina with uh, meat of sorts, uh, we've had giraffe walking past, so it's all in all quite fascinating out here on the plains, but I think I'm going to start up and head back down towards the river. We've got some hyena lurking there in front. It's always interesting to go and follow up with them because they're always up to something, especially if it's in the early morning like this. They should be heading to bed. And if they're walking around, it generally means that something's on the go. Hyena, always a good option if you're running out of things to follow. We've got one lying in the road here. I don't want to disturb it. Let's see. It's lifted its head up. Just hearing us falling into the hole here. And there are a few behind it as well. And that's quite a lovely sight that in the morning sunshine. Nice spotted hyena. Looks like it's starting to doze off already. After a very busy evening, I'm sure of causing chaos. We hear them every night around camp and they can move massive distances in one night. I've heard stories of up to 50 kilometers in one evening. So it's rather, rather entertaining, I find, to be watching hyena. They are really the clowns for me of the night watch. It's a shame. I don't want to disturb this one that's having a little snooze here. I'm going to go back and take another road down towards the river. Be very rude of me to get this hyena up out of its snoozing spot. I wouldn't like to be messed around if I was trying to have a snooze. We've got some warthogs heading through here too. There's a surprise. Seems like the lions in the area really enjoy eating warthog. Their little pork snack. But at least they're keeping their numbers a bit in check. They do breed prolifically. It's important that they are controlled. Clifford, you're wondering how long lions and hyenas have been rivals? Well, I think as long as they have been at the top of the uh, food chain and the apex predators slash uh, decomposer, because remember hyenas can be very efficient hunters too, so they just... Um, and they're just falling into that scavenger bracket because they are quite adept at chasing lions or cheetah or leopard off their kill and taking it for themselves. But how long have they been rivals? I would say we need to look back to see when um, lions actually evolved into the state that they are today as well as the hyenas. And I'm pretty sure that you would find that they're their evolution probably coincides. Now, I just want to show Archie, we do have a, a hyena over there that we can have a look at, but I'm going to do some homework and I'm just going to see exactly how long ago these predators have evolved in these particular habitats to be rivals and from whence they started that rivalry? That's a good question and nice for me to have some homework. I always like to be looking things up in between drives. And once again, I've had a question I was not able to answer in complete. So I'm going to have a look at that and join us for this afternoon's drive and I should have a, an answer for you. 
Right, while we watch this hyena heading towards the river, we're going to head in the same direction as well, but let's send you back down to South Africa because I think somebody has found one of the Birmingham boys. Yes, we've got into a better spot now. Not that it's the best spot because he's not facing us, but he is just south of our southern boundary. This big Birmingham male. I'm not sure which individual it is. Maybe you guys can help identify it, please. Now, just to um, clear up uh, a little statement that I said earlier, just so that everyone's fully in the loop and understanding what I meant by us possibly moving from the Sabi Sands is that essentially we've got a very small traverse here at the moment of about just over 1,500 hectares and in the Sabi Sands in my opinion you need at least about 6,000 hectares as a min min minimum to be able to get about and be able to follow a pride of lion and or have multiple leopards that you can go to and actually be able to deliver a good safari. So it's a little bit limiting our size at the moment and what I said was that if we cannot manage to negotiate any better plans and to get more land here, it may make more sense for us to go elsewhere. And of course that will be sad because the Sabi Sands is incredible but it is important to remember that there are many wonderful wilderness destinations in Africa and if there is another spot that allows us to do our job better and take you on better safaris well then I think it's definitely worth looking into exploring that avenue so that is the reality it's not like it's imminent but I just think it is important to know that there could be some change and we may head off elsewhere to an area where we've got more land to explore and it definitely will allow us to do a better job and take you on better safaris so there's no plans for that to happen at the moment it's just in the future it could happen hope that helps now I'm wondering what to do here because it is a nice cloudy day nice and cool I don't think he's necessarily going to be seeking any shelter or shade there's multiple little water holes where he's come from so I don't think he's necessarily going to come across to twin dams which is where we are he may come closer towards us hopefully for a drink who knows we're gonna stick around there for a few more minutes and send you across to Tristan to see what he's getting up to now Well, what we're doing is we're just busy sort of ambling about at the moment, just seeing what else is around and seeing what else we can find. And so I'm thinking about heading up towards Hyena Den. Apparently there was nothing really there this morning, but we're going to try and head that way. But before I went in that direction, what I wanted to do was just come past Treehouse and then go around Shibamu, the new road, and check up our western boundary in case that new leopard is somewhere around. So that new male, you never know, maybe he's in that area. Feels like a good day to go and look for him. I, I feel like with this weather that we've had, maybe he's there's a successful number of cats out here that have killed things and so it's worth just going up that way and having a little look around. I might be wrong and we might get nothing at all but it is definitely worth it. What is quite a shock is that I haven't actually spent any time at Treehouse Dam recently and certainly haven't paid any attention when I've driven here but it is really getting very low. I didn't even notice it the other day but I can see now that this is really starting to shrink quite quickly and you would think being in summer that I would be saying the opposite that there would be water sort of you know filling up and these dams would be getting bigger but they're not they're actually getting smaller by the day and and this little section that we have very close to to me which is down at the bank side and if you follow that shoreline coming along Ferg and then you come down to where I am you'll see there's a fallen over tree now I remember watching Hosanna maybe six weeks ago drinking from between where that fallen over tree is so a little bit to the left there you see that there's two fallen over trees one face to the left one faces to the right and he drank between that area please excuse the pole from the roof but he drank there so you can see how much that water is decreased and that he wouldn't be able to drink there at all now he would have had to have done a different route round so absolutely different and looks like it's still drying and and the rain that we're having now even though it's wetting the ground is really not going to fill up any dams this is just good for growth of, of plants it's not great sort of filling weather if we want to call it that
Also, interestingly enough, in some of that elephant dung, a little bit further, I think, folk, to the right there, you can see that there are some fungi and that are growing out of the dung by the looks of things. There's some white stuff in there. So which fungus it is, I'm not 100% sure. It's very far away, but very cool to see. Right, while I contemplate fungus and elephant poop and all things like that, let's rather go to a much prettier scene of Scotty D with the beautiful Birmingham boy. Well, not the most beautiful scene, but it is a scene nonetheless. We are having to snipe a view of him from a distance. But what we wanted to show you is that he's limping quite badly. And this, I'm fairly certain, is Ntsuko, who was one of the two males that we were spending time with yesterday evening. I'm just going to turn the vehicle. It looks like we're in luck. It appears he's coming on to Juma, which means we should be able to get you some good views. Let's just creep up ahead a little bit. Fairly certain it's in or not in Tino that has limp um, and Tristan's not too sure how it got that injury but it could have been hunting buffalo they had a buffalo kill quite recently I'm told and what is it that's got his attention has he heard something there are some water buck up ahead of us we're not going to be able to show them to you because our rain flaps in the way. But I'm guessing that maybe he's heard another male lion or something's at least caught his attention. Let's keep moving forward and try and get you some more views. Keep coming on to our side, buddy. I think we're just going to have to look close to the Mulwati riverbed which is just up ahead of us and hope that he continues towards us. I'm just worried because there's quite a few vehicles in the sighting so I don't want to overcomplicate the matter. There are only supposed to be three vehicles per sighting. But I think there's a few more now because of the fact that we are on a bit of a boundary. It's hard to control the sightings. And Oregon, no, we don't have any idea how he got the limp. Tristan seems to think maybe it was while they were hunting buffalo. They made a buffalo kill fairly recently. Um, so not entirely sure. But now at least we will be able to get you some views of him. Pole might sadly be right in the middle of our view, but he's thankfully coming on to Juma, which means we should be able to get some wonderful views of him. I think we just need to wait here though. Let me move forward a tiny bit. Actually swing a little bit this way. Uh, there we go. I'm actually going to move out of the sighting guys, there's so many vehicles here and I don't really want to be involved in this mess. So we will leave them be and hope that he comes onto our property and try and show these guys, try and lead by example possibly, because guys are making some foolish decisions I believe and while we wait patiently we will send you across to Tristan. Well, Scotty, hopefully all will pay out. I wonder if that male lion is not on his way towards uh, those two leopards. It will be interesting if he gets that scent because he is moving in that general direction. And I'm sure Hosanna and Tingana will get a bit of a fright if a big Birmingham boy comes walking that way. Now, I thought I saw something on this plant here. No, it's just a conglomeration of leaves that are here. I thought it was a whole bunch of wasps together on a nest, but it wasn't. It's just a whole bunch of leaves. It might have been an old social, um, not social, community nest spider, and that is just kind of washed away and broken up. It's difficult to actually see. It's some sort of nest. It doesn't look like a community nest spider at all. 
there are spider strands there and maybe like I say it's just a very badly damaged one and this is just the remnants of what was there you can see all of those leaves and things are very dry and old and the web itself is even not constructed properly so it must have been one of those it's just a very old one that is now just decaying away and the silken strands have all left it is an interesting spider web I think there's another one a spider's web with rain on it, Fergus. Well, that's that's wonderful news. We know how we like a droplet. Let's go back and have a little look. Oh, look at that. That is that is beautiful. You want? Uh, where, do you want me to go forward or back? Let's go forward a little bit because pole is in the way. So there is Fergus's spider web covered in the water droplets of the rain. Oh, good luck focusing on that, Fergus. That's not going to be easy at all. Fergus is going to try and use a leaf somehow to... There, oh, there you are. You're almost there. There, are, there we go. Well done. And there's all our beautiful little droplets. Looks like rows of pearls on a spider's web. Now, it would be really nice if there was a big orb web spider in amongst that. That would be wonderful. But this is not an orb web nest, and or the web, should I say. And so no chance of them being in the middle of that but how pretty is that with all of the little droplets i think it's very pretty i think it's worth looking and i know yesterday i got flack from my fellow teammates about watching water droplets and seeing how long it would drop off a berry but they're not complaining they're not complaining today because this is apparently prettier than my water droplet on my little quarry berry no oh, well at least i know now what i can and can't do but i think it's very cool to see and spider webs are absolutely amazing things if you think about how thin those strands are and what the weight of water is and how it's able to hold that many droplets just gives you an idea of the tensile strength of the spiderweb nest well done fergus very well spotted i'm very impressed fergus is awake this morning this is what you're awake this morning fergus more or less yes well if you weren't you did when that little cup popped out so <laughs> Right, let's carry on and see what else is around. There's lots of interesting little things. That's why I like the rain. Is, I mean, I don't like the rain from a point of view that it's cold, it's wet, it gets all of our equipment wet, and it's a bit of a difficult thing with poles and roofs and all of those kind of things. It certainly makes life a little tougher. But in terms of what comes out in nature, you get a lot of really interesting things. I'm sure we're going to get some alert hatches in the next couple of days. We should also get, hopefully, some flowers coming out. You might find... Um, we'll get some insect explosions and so it really is quite nice when you get those kind of things oh purple phoenix you're wondering what types of spiders are found out here so many different species we've got a lot of different spiders out here we've got venomous ones non-venomous ones beautiful ones ugly ones ones that will creep you out in the middle of the night and if some of you any spider will creep you out if you see it so there are all kinds of different species but we have orb webs we have button spiders we've got violent spiders sack spiders crab spiders um what else am i missing wolf spiders bark spiders exactly fergus the list is, is the list is long. It's jumping spiders, Salticidae, and lots of them. So we really are spoilt. We've got a, a number of really nice spider species around this area, and they've got some beautiful webs. Sorry, excuse me, I've got something in my eye. Hey, just you're wondering what kind of spider would have made that web. Difficult to say without actually seeing the spider. It's, I mean, it's a general kind of web construct. Um, I would, it's, it's not a crab spider, that's for sure, and it's probably not one of the jumping spiders. I mean, I would hazard a guess that it could be one of the orb web family. So it may be an, an angulate orb web. Um, it could be that. I didn't say it wasn't a, an orb web, but I was referring to golden and garden orb webs. The, the thing is, though, it doesn't have a stabilimentum constructed in to the web which is generally a very good sign of the orb web species a stabilimentum is basically a thickened area of silk that is often built into the web and it's either a linear line or an x across the web like that and it basically they do that so that other animals can see the web and then basically leave them alone and try and kind of basically walk 
through the web and, and, and hurts it. So, or not hurts it, but, it, but break the web. So, I mean, difficult to say. I, I would like to kind of have a look and see. Could be bark spiders, the remnants of bark spiders from the night. They do often construct their webs and then most of the time they eat it again to gain the nutrients back and then they'll start to send that nutrients, you know, and then they use it again at night. They build a new one. So, could be them and with the rain they've just left it alone. Um, that's their kind of sort of shape of their web is often that sort of very rounded with long um, structure lines going off from there. So maybe bark spider? Difficult to say which one it is. All right, let's see. I think I'm going to take that new road like I was saying just now and have a little look. I heard something now on the radio about quarantine as well, which is interesting. Somewhere around Gowrie, Maine. Maybe Scotty is in that area and can get an update as to where exactly quarantine is, but sounds like somewhere towards Gowrie, Maine. It could be in Coroside, of course, because he does spend time there or even a little bit further towards the KMP boundary, but you never know. Maybe he's on Chitler side and there's a chance that we get to see quarantine. I'm sure Scott would love to see quarantine out of all the presenters, him and Brent have spent the most amount of time with Quarantine and Kunyuma, and so I'm pretty sure Scott would love to catch up with them and just kind of see how they're doing and or see how he's doing in particular. Ah, he's going into Torchwood. That's not ideal. Sorry, Scotty. Well, there's still tomorrow is another day or this afternoon. You never know if he goes into Torchwood. He could always come back out again towards Chitwa and, and maybe we get lucky with Quarantine being around. Hello, kudus. There's some kudus that are here on my left-hand side. There we go. How beautiful are they? So everybody seems to be out and about. I think after a bit of rain, we might find that a couple of these antelope species do move out and just try and dry off a little bit. Also, there'll be lots of little growth of new trees in these open areas. And so kudus, even though they are browsers, you can see the one in the back there has got its sort of face down in the grass. It's not actually eating grass itself. It's rather looking for little forbs and new little trees that could be growing in that section. So that's why they kind of got their heads down at the moment and taking advantage of all the new growth from the rain. Very cool to see. And they've actually been very relaxed with us. Generally, Kudu kind of move off and into the thicket and try and obscure themselves and hide themselves visually by going behind a bush. But you, these guys are being very cooperative and sitting right out in the open. And I like Kudu. I think they've, they've got a good look about them. They've got massive, beautiful ears. And then these white markings that they've got as well are very cool. Now, that particular one seems a little on the skinny side. So it's going to have to have eat a little bit more to be able to kind of fill out those hip areas it also looks as though it's pregnant so you can see the stomach is kind of hanging a little bit which is a indication that there's going to be a little kudu around in the next few weeks or months Okay, Kudus, well, lovely to see you and catch up with you guys as well. I'm going to continue my journey to try and find our mystery leopard. I, yeah, he's not been seen or anyone has kind of indicated that he's around, but I just have a feeling that he's in this area today. And so I thought, well, nobody's driven here. I might as well come and have a look and maybe we get lucky. And he's sitting in a tree with an impala carcass and we get a few days of mystery leopard action well that's the idea anyway i'm not sure it's going to come to fruition but we'll try our luck anyway while we do that let's go to ralph who i'm not sure what he's up to in the mara but i'm sure it will be fun nonetheless yes everybody so we're still driving around having a look to see if we can follow up a little bit on these lions but um in the meantime let's have a look a little bit at the scene that is um uh, presenting itself to us up in front here there, there's a, a grouping of giraffe with some buffalo in front of a lovely sight with the escarpment in the background with the escarpment in the background the lions just yet, but there were a lot of hyena that we did come across. A lot of a lot of speed. Follow all around there, going into 
to feed on that. So there's a, a nice little symbiotic relationship going on there. And they, it is mutually beneficial because the, the egrets will let the buffalo know if there's predators on their way. So a nice them. And the egrets get to eat all sorts of little insects as they get bumped out by the big fat buffalo walking through the plain. And there's a giraffe um, trying his luck on, but it looks like it's probably more of a dominance display that.